Judy Helgen, I'm a retired research scientist, PhD from the Minnesota Pollution Control, Control Agency. I've been retired 10 years, but it doesn't feel like it. And, <laughs> and what I did was write a book published by the University of Massachusetts Press last summer called Peril in the Ponds. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the issues that came up in all that decade that I was very involved leading the investigation into deformed frogs in Minnesota. And I also, my heart was really in the biological monitoring of wetlands. And so that's, that's how that um, kind of got into my lab was my concern about biological indicators of environmental health in general. And I just want to say that we were kind of pioneers in the early 90s at the Pollution Control Agency for water quality biological monitoring. And now they have 16 classified staff, which means they have permanent jobs, which I didn't have until closely before I retired. So I was living on the edge with EPA funding every step of the way. It was controversial everything I did, everything. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about wetlands and a little bit about frogs, which is what the book is really about, too. And most of us know that wetlands have a lot of diversity that you see above water, you know, dragonflies flying around, you see turtles, um, various waterfowl. Even now, in my little pond, we have wood ducks with the ice all around it. Um, but in order to understand the actual water quality of a wetland, or what we call the biological integrity, you have to get in there and sample. So this is one of my great student assistants. Um, we did netted the wetlands to see what the aquatic life is in the water. That's the way to tell the water quality. It's the way they look at streams and lakes with fish communities and invertebrates. <coughs> and so what we looked at was all, or all like, you know, snails, clams, dragonflies, sandflies, midges, even leeches. You have more kinds of leeches in a healthy water. Uh, little crustaceans, uh, mayflies, caddisflies. There's an emergent mayfly up on the left that are a good water quality indicator for wetlands and streams. And, and the dragonflies are very sensitive. So there's an adult emerging, but they're really sensitive indicators to water quality. Well, wetlands also nurture frogs. So here are four species. I think we have 12, 12 or 13 in Minnesota. Uh, the little tree frog, the green frog, uh, leopard frog, and the chorus frog down at the bottom. Most of our work was on the one on the lower right, the common, well, what was common leopard frog, uh, now threatened in many parts of the United States and Canada. And these frogs have different habits. So the leopard frog comes to a wetland to reproduce, and then it migrates a half a mile or more to either a river, water, or a lake to spend the winter. So they don't go out in the mud, but they're in the water. So the leopard frogs might be, say, in the Minnesota River for six months. Um, the little tree frog and the chorus frog have to have debris around their landscape because they actually spend the winter on the land. They make their own antifreeze. It's an, it's an amazing thing. So people who clean up around their wetlands shouldn't do it. Frogs grow up in wetlands. Um, they lay the eggs in the water. Uh, they, they have this little uh, fish-like stage with gills. And they go through the amazing development, which I'll just <coughs> throw out right now, is entirely driven by thyroid hormone and another chemical you probably have never heard of called retinoic acid. And, and it goes through this amazing transformation of finally it will absorb the, you know, the rear legs come out first, uh, the front legs pop out later, uh, it, it absorbs the tail, it becomes a lung breather, it's just an incredible thing. And once they are a little adult, they come out. And those are the ones that we saw with the deformities, were the, the young of the year. Well, I had a phone call in 1995. In 93, I had been involved chasing after deformed frogs out in the Granite Falls area, got emergency funding from EPA, and my colleague and I went back out there. We went all over the landscape in 94. Not a deformed frog in the area, but they were there in 93. And so I was already worried that my, if 
I got involved with the corn frogs. Again, I had lost my credibility with my bosses, which wasn't all that great anyway. <laughs> so in 95, in August, I got a phone call from a teacher named Cindy Reinitz at a new charter school, the Minnesota New Country School, which at the time was in storefronts like G. Williger's Bar and some other places in Lesur. They now have a whole school in Henderson, Minnesota, very close to the Minnesota River. Well, she happened to be taking the kids out on a nature walk in August. Her voice quavered over the phone as she described a hellish scene with frogs. Frogs with stumps of legs, frogs missing a leg, frogs with twisted joints, some with extra legs that couldn't move. They look really pathetic. She paused, we need help. And it was mid-August. Listening to Cindy, I held my breath. Another nightmare in a wetland, I thought. Remembering the deformed frogs reported to me two years earlier by a woman who lived in Granite Falls in west central Minnesota. Well, we went down. I couldn't go immediately because my colleague and I were involved with EPA doing a film shoot. And, and so I sent my student worker, Joel, down. And Mark and I are out in central Minnesota with EPA. Late on Tuesday, August 15th, Mark and I were on the road in central Minnesota for the EPA film shoot when our clunky, portable phone rang. It was Joel, sounding shaken, an urgent tone in his voice. Judy, you have got to go down there. Those frogs are awful. Lots of them are grossly malformed. Maybe 40 of 100. I looked at head deformities. It's unbelievable. Well, then Joel and I went down on Friday when I was free of the EPA crew. And we drove to the Nye Pond. It's spelled N-E-Y, and it's on the, I guess you'd call it the east side of the Minnesota River, across from Henderson. So we're coming into this farm site, which is now dedicated to an environmental learning area. To our right sat small cattle sheds in an old farmhouse, Don Nye's place. Near the pond in an open, grassy area stood clusters of kids and adults some looked excited, others appeared troubled as they watched us roll in. Beside the few parked vehicles lay buckets, nets, day packs, and loose boots scattered around on the ground. I would remember the scene forever. And then we started looking at the frogs, and they were, they were really terrible. I picked up one and, and, uh, and then another. The first had a rear leg completely missing, like a total amputation, except the skin looked normal. Then there was one that had a leg that just spun around uselessly. And I said, this is awful. Some of them have extra legs, a kid said. And he reached in the bucket and pulled out a tiny frog with an extra leg. Feeling my stomach churn, I looked up at the expectant faces. I glanced at the pond. As water was calm, as shoreline fringed with tall grasses, so innocent looking, so rural, a place for kids to learn about birds, bugs, plants, and pond life, not handle deformed animals. And so we had, we had a huge um, feeling of responsibility to try to get at this problem, which, as you probably know, became an epidemic across the country and in many other countries. So I'm just going to show you, I mean, these are the gruesome pictures, but but uh, to make a point that some of the pictures of the frogs with extra legs are the ones that kind of went viral, but it really was the ones that had missing or partial legs that were 60% or more of the deformities that we saw, that they saw in New England, that they saw in Canada and many other areas. This frog looks like it's missing a leg, but there's a little foot folded back. You know, and this one has, it's almost like a thalidomide legs, you know, with a little stump of a leg. And we had uh, scientists from the National Wildlife Health Lab examining the frogs and rarely were they an injury. These were real developmental deformities. And the ones like the one that I took up there with the extra leg, useless, that's the type that went all over the internet and became the icon for the deformed frogs, which later created some problems because of a parasite could cause that type of deformity. Um, so we had, you know, bent legs, um, just every, I never got used to looking at them. And the one I took on the left is the one that really became 
um, a natural thing. On the upper right, there was a skin webbing, which made it really difficult for the frogs to jump. They have to jump to catch their, their bugs. The one on the lower left is from a crowing county side, and that's one of the better frogs from 70% of a particular species of frog deformed there. On the right, one missing an eye. Occasionally, we'd see tree frogs uh, missing an eye. Bob McKinnell's lab at the university worked with us, and his technician had some of our deformed frogs, and she was trying to feed them. And she went into the mouth, and, and there was an eye projecting into the throat. I went to a meeting in Canada, because the Canadians were kind of on this before we were in like 91, 93. And Mark, one of the scientists there showed a frog that had the eye on the side of, it, of the abdomen. I mean, it was development gone awry. And later we learned that there were internal uh, skeletal deformities also. Well, by 97, we had field crews. We had to beg for money. <laughs> um, and, and what I want to say here, two things real quick. Uh, these locations were all called in. I was getting inundated with phone calls, and, and my colleague was. And from citizens, you know, their kids, you know, grandkids, their whatever had seen deformed frogs. And every time you'd ask them, had you seen them before? And they'd say, no. And none of them were bogus. Every site that we went out to and did our surveys with a protocol of collecting under frogs, etc., cetera, was, was correct. So in 96, I was at a, the first meeting that EPA held. And a couple of EPA scientists were kind of grumbling about the citizen science. You know, data from citizens doesn't really meet our data quality standards. And I just got furious. I stood up and I said, you know, if we hadn't had all this, these reports from the people of Minnesota and the kids, we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even be studying this problem. So, um, and I just put this in to honor Bob McKinnell, professor of the year, and also to and Cindy Ryan is the teacher there, but also to make the point that Bob and another a biologist, Dave Hoppe, had surveyed frogs for decades in Minnesota and in, into the Dakotas interested in the color genetics and never had they seen deformities like we were seeing in the night for the two of them and they were kind of our historic record and the other part here is that bob has what he calls the lunker leopard frog and and he told me that in their surveys where they measured them they were rarely seeing lunkers anymore whereas they used to see them a lot which also meant that the adult frog populations weren't living as long as they have What's a lunker? A lunker is 90 millimeters or longer, like that one there. So it's probably four years old, maybe. OK, so my agency didn't really want to have anything to do with deformed frogs. Now, to be fair, in the early 90s, mid-90s, the idea of doing biological monitoring to measure water quality was still sort of suspect, or it was not completely accepted. I mean, the Pollution Control Agency grew up with heroic people, I know some of them, who, who regulated and controlled wastewater discharge, industrial discharge, you know, end of pipe toxics. And, you know, one of my bosses told me later that and, and when he was working there at the beginning in the 70s, anything you did could make a difference. Okay, so they were civil engineers, they, were, they had a whole different point of view. And the other part was frogs, they should be able to do the DNR. But the Pollution Control Agency is under the Clean Water Act, although it's, you know, their powers are what he's trying to get robbed. But they are under the Clean Water Act to measure water pollution. It's their job. So it was the kids who really drove it. Here are a couple of the kids at the night pond. Um, they really, and I won't read, normally I read some of their testimony to the legislature, but. And the media started out early. Ken Speaks did the first piece on Carol Edenshill, new, uh, TV News. Um, then it went into the national media. And the kids um, testified to the legislature. Some of them are adults with families down there, very involved in their community. They had media. We were swamped with the media. I mean, we would, I'd come home from a field trip and Mark would say, well, CBS is downstairs with us. <laughs> <laughs> I finally had to say, you know, cop, we're not going to get any work done at all. But it went on for a couple of years where we were just totally inundated. And I want to say that a politician can make a difference. Willard Munger, who 
served until almost before he died, adopted the fraud problem. And he tried to get us funding uh, to the Pollution Control Agency for me to lead an investigation of the first funding. And we were going over, I was going over to the legislative hearing, and, and uh, I get an email from a manager saying, you know, uh, if you're asked if the PCA will support Munger's bill for the fraud work, you'll have to say no. And so I say, well, what am I going to say to all these kids who are coming up from the Minnesota New Country School to testify? Well, <clears throat> normally I would read some of the, their testimonies, <clears throat> and it's just amazing. They wrote their own pleas about, I mean, 12 year olds, 15, 13, 14. They wrote their pleas about the, what the frogs mean about the environment and how we need to do something, and nobody ever asked the question. We got the we got the money from Representative Munger. <laughs> but as you know, he did a lot for Minnesota. Uh, nobody asked the question whether the PCA would support Yeah, I, I wasn't. Well, oh, the, I should also say they sent over the assistant commissioner because my division director said Judy shouldn't be put in that position. So the assistant commissioner came over, and she was going to answer it if it was asked, and it never was. I mean, everybody was practically crying by the time the kids <laughs> finished their testimony. <laughs> And I don't go at length. I'd be glad to answer questions. I kind of want to have some time for questions. Uh, but there, you know, there are natural causes of deformities, and and there was a lot of media attention, almost like a campaign to tout a particular parasite that can invade the base of the tadpole as the little limb bud is developing, and can cause particularly branched or multiple limbs. Now, right here, I want to point, and it was shown in the lab that this is possible. And, and so it's one of those issues where there, there are chemicals also that can cause branched or multiple limbs, but the parasite was demonstrated as a possible cause. But I think it's 9% overall head branched or multiple limbs. So I, that's why I say minor. And then the newer one is the predators nipping the little limb buds of the tadpoles as, as a county kind of, member I said 60% have these what we call limb deficiencies and uh, dragonflies are getting implicated and and there's a long-term study in Michigan at the George's Reserve uh, run by one of the profs there uh, Earl Werner and his group has studied for decades the the biology the the dragonflies they have tons of dragonflies uh, larvae which you know, are super predatory in their wetlands, their 36 wetlands. And they have found over, I think it's 13, 14 years, they have found 10 out of 36,000 frogs with deformity. Well, we're looking at eight out of 100, or 20 out of 100, or 60 out of 100, you know. So, it, so down there it says it's possible because in the lab you can get a put tadpoles and dragonflies together and you, they will, they'll, they're ferocious, you know, they could not it. Uh, possible, but not plausible to those of us. And the other part being the dragonflies are water quality indicators and their, their species, they're reducing because of pollution to wetland. And I won't go on, I mean, I, there's a lot of possible environmental causes. Ultraviolet might be a factor because it can make some chemicals more toxic in the water and it can make other chemicals less toxic. And uh, I, there's some interesting stories I could tell here. There's huge toxicity testing gaps for, for pollution, particularly for pesticides, but all the other chemicals that are getting out in the water now. Very rarely tested for causing developmental abnormalities in mammals, let alone in frogs, okay? So we have enormous gaps. And, and I, I could talk about, how I was at the, an international meeting in August in Canada and the ecotoxicology group of scientists from Canada, US, Australia were getting together for a meetup and worried about EPA's lack of regulation of pesticides. And, and I could say more about that. They tried to get a coordinated letter into science and science turned it down, which is... Oh, and backing back up there, um, Activated charcoal could remove the activity in the water. And if you pass water through activated charcoal, which was very good because we had one big blowout when we had used 
we're work not, by now working with several scientists, different federal agencies, and we use people's well water in Chisago County. Oh, I don't know, to get at the groundwater. And it caused deformities in frogs in the lab test. And, and it, that blew out, I don't remember, but that was one of the blowouts in the Star Tribune. And luckily, the federal lab found out, I got a call at night from Jim saying, Hacavita charcoal removes it. And so we immediately got charcoal filter systems to all the, these three or four landowners. Um, okay, wrong one. And I just briefly say there are several pesticides that can cause deformities. Their additives, the one in Roundup is getting even recently now more uh, bad news about causing toxicity of the frogs and other animals. Um, a lot of this is secret. I couldn't even find out what pesticides were used by the frog ponds because there's no right to know. I mean, even a neighbor can't find out what chemicals are being used by a farmer next door. And it's called confidential business information. And particularly the additives that go in when a pesticide is applied, like, like Roundup, which is glyphosate, which is maybe not harmful, but the stuff that they have to put with it to get it to penetrate the leaves of the plants is toxic. And, but the, the manufacturers don't have to reveal what they put in there. And endocrine disruptors could be another whole talk, but hormonal agents, and a lot of, I'll just say quickly, a lot of it has been on the chemicals that you've heard of that have feminized male fish that are, you know, estrogenic chemicals, you know, the BPAs and the plastics and pharmaceuticals and some pesticides. But I'm interested in hormonal disruptors that disrupt thyroid hormone. And EPA is just beginning to look into how do we test. We don't, we don't have the precautionary principle here, so harm has to be shown after a chemical is out in the environment, which is much, much harder. And then there are several metals, I just named mercury, selenium, and nickel, but there are several metals that are known to cause developmental deformities. All of this is to say the mystery is not yet solved. Uh, but in the book at the end, I review human birth defects, and when I was doing that review for the last chapter, I discovered that we don't understand the cause of 60% or more human birth defects. So why would we have been able to solve the frogs in 10 years? You know? and, and I want to say that it was not new. That was the other reason to show Bob McKinnell. Um, I mean, it is new. It's a new problem that started in the 90s and, and you know, I don't know, 40 states, uh, Russia, Japan, um, Canada, and other, other countries. And they are still being found all over the United States. And I took out a slide that has some data on that that the US Fish and Wildlife has surveyed in the last 10 years. 153 wildlife refuges all over the US. You know, Alaska, New England, East Coast, Southern states. And they're finding high frequencies of deformed frogs 2000 to 2010. I'm waiting for their report to come out. It, I, my flag is up because it's keeps having to have some statistical review. Um, and I just briefly mentioned that frogs are in peril globally. So the extinctions of frogs began, you know, around the 1980s when biologists were dismayed in Costa Rica and Australia and other Central American countries to find frogs disappearing rather precipitously. And so these are two maybe separate issues. Uh, and a lot of frog populations are in decline. And even the leopard frog, that's what got me when I learned that the leopard frog is gone from most of its historic locations in California, British Columbia, it's disappearing in the Pacific Northwest. Here it's still sort of okay, but everybody, I talk to older people and they say, you know, we don't see those migrations that we used to see when they came across the road down to the Minnesota River, or, you know, we don't hear the frogs that we used to hear, and there's multiple reasons for that. Well, quickly on the wetlands, because it's parallel to ponds, the left map is from DNR, the red shows you where there's zero to five percent of the natural wetlands left mm -hmm. in the southwestern western part. So if you remember that map where we had a lot of deformed frogs up through the central state, that's where we have a lot of what we call these depressional wetlands, the shallow ones, the frogs have to use to reproduce. They, 
people excavate their ponds and go fishing. Let the, let the, the fish eat the tadpoles, you know. They have to go to the shallow ones. Well, the biologist, yay, last summer put out a report on the quality of wetlands using the biological index that we had been developing. This is with the plant community that we did it with invertebrates. 61% of those wetlands through the middle of the state are considered poor quality. They have excellent, good, fair, and poor as the four categories. Poor is enough to put them on EPA's impaired waters list. But I think the agency has maybe 12 wetlands listed as polluted, but they're polluted. And very quickly, you know, the urban stormwater runoff, it's not just the road salt chloride, which really hammers the invertebrates. It's the coal tar sealants, which I think the communities are banning now, and it's a number of other chemicals. We have, at the meeting I was at in Wisconsin, the Lakes Conference, I wish I could remember, somebody had a really great phrase for describing these urban lawns that, where people just take out all the vegetation. And, you know, so then their fertilizers and their herbicides go in. And, you know, I just took this one up north of home here, runoff. But there's also agricultural pollution. Um, and the, the pesticides are applied very heavily in the spring. The USGS Geological Survey found, has found pesticides in rainfall. Um, they found them in the Nye Pond. There are four agricultural tile lines that drain in there. And they found a few. And we found them in some of the frog tissue. What do you do with the data when you don't have the guidelines for what level is toxic? Um, I think the PCA and water quality standards has maybe 12, 13 pesticides listed for water that they can regulate. And we have, and some of those are the oldies like DDT and chloridine that aren't used anymore. And, and you know, we use hundreds of pesticides in the state. And so, you know, we also get nutrient runoff or fertilizer runoff. And I put this in usually for other people, but to make the point that Agricultural land is regulated, is not regulated because it's called non-point runoff. It's just you know, stuff that comes over the landscape. And I just put this in because actually indeed the subsurface tiles drain the wetlands, drain the farmland into pipes, which do discharge into ditches and streams. There's another one right here. Um, maybe they could, I mean, it's a wild idea. Maybe they could re be regulated as point source pollution like industrial and wastewater discharge. And so the hope, one of my peer reviewers said, well, what hope is there? Uh, the hope, you know, is people will get out there and get kids out of nature. That would be another good session for us to have because uh, there are issues there. Let them get off the trail is better than environmental education. The, at the Nye Pond, there's now an environmental learning area. Lower left is Becky Pollock, who was one of the students. I should say that the charter school had project-based learning, which really made it ideal for the frog group, capital letters, to develop. And so they stayed together as a cohesive whole. And then the Straubs, who are retired teachers down there, and just you know, pure gold, out there doing their nature neighbors, getting kids outside. And then I do like these my grandkids. I have to say that the future lies with our mm -hmm. children and our grandchildren. And good. The people who are going out and restoring wetlands, like the Straubs are restoring land. And, I mean, there are a lot of people who are quietly going out. And I won't read all of it, but just near the end. Um, I applaud the host of unpaid volunteers who work to promote a healthy environment and better conservation of habitats through various nonprofit organizations, the writers and the artists who speak the truth, and dare I say it, the politicians who, like Minnesota's late representative Willard Munger, consistently work for a safer, cleaner environment. The way lies forward in the hands of many dedicated scientists, teachers, kids, government workers, and ordinary citizens who want to protect amphibians and help save our remaining fragile wetlands before it's too late. They promise solutions and inspire us to keep trying even when positive change seems out of reach, they believe otherwise. To all this cloud of people who pour their lives and their passions into understanding and saving Earth's vulnerable creatures and fragile habitats, 
even when things look dire, I say, God's people.